Hello and welcome to our audience members joining us from across the globe. I'm Raymond Karam, I'm the Chief Program and Development Officer here at AGSIW. And I want to wish uh, Ramadan Karim to all our friends and audience members who are fasting during this holy month of Ramadan. Uh, we're happy to be continuing our book series today by hosting the launch of another excellent volume. Uh, the book is titled The Gulf States and the Horn of Africa, Interests, Influences, and Instability, and takes a deep dive into the complexities of power projection, political rivalry, and conflict across the Earth, Sea, and beyond. We have an excellent panel of experts with us featuring current and former colleagues and longtime friends of AGSIW who have edited or contributed to this volume. I'll introduce them briefly here and share a link to their full bios in the chat with you. Uh, first, I'll start with uh, Omar Karim, a visiting fellow at the Royal United Services Institute, where he focuses on Pakistan's evolving political and security environment within its neighborhood. He's also a doctoral researcher at the Department of Political Science and International Studies at the University of Birmingham. His academic research focuses on Saudi Arabian foreign policy and politics, in particular the Saudi-Iran regional rivalry and the broader, the broader geopolitics of the Middle East. Also with us is uh, Simon Maben, a co-editor of this volume. He is a professor of international politics at Lancaster University, where he is also the director of the Richardson Institute and serves as a director of the Carnegie fund funded CPAT project. His research focuses on the impact of the rivalry between Saudi Arabia and Iran on states, identities, and communities across the Middle East. He's the author of many publications and his latest book, House, Houses Built on Sand, was published in September, 2020. Last but not least is our good friend, Karen Young, uh, who is a senior fellow and the founding director of the Program on Economics and Energy at the Middle East Institute. Previously, she was a resident scholar at the American Enterprise Institute. And before AEI, she served as a senior resident scholar at ABSIW. She has taught courses on the international relations and economy of the Middle East at the George Washington University and the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies and regularly teaches at the U.S. Department of State uh, Foreign Service Institute. Moderating the session today is Robert Mason, a co-editor of this volume and a non-resident fellow at AGSIW. He is a fellow with the CPAT project at Lancaster University, and previously he was an associate professor and director of the Middle East Studies Center at the American University in Cairo, and a visiting research fellow at the King Faisal Center for Research and Islamic Studies in Riyadh. He specializes in Gulf politics and the international relations of the Middle East. His latest books include New Perspectives on the Middle East Politics, uh, Economy, Society, and International Relations. I'd also like to mention that the publishers of this volume have extended a 40% discount to our audience members who wish to purchase the book. Uh, I'll share the link uh, and the discount code with you all in the chat as well. Uh, and with that, Robert, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Raymond. And, uh... Very nice to be with everybody today. I'd just like to extend my thanks to AGSIW for uh, hosting this launch of the book today, uh, which is right here. This is uh, Gulf States and the Horn of Africa. And as, I, as Raymond mentions, there's 40% discount. So if you haven't received uh, that by email uh, in the leaflet, please let me know and I'll be happy to send that through to you. All right. So just to um, do an introduction to the book, really. Um, the volume is based on the workshop at the Gulf Research Meeting in Cambridge. It brings together diverse contemporary strands on some of the most intense and consequential competition between the Gulf states in the Horn. It studies how regional security complexes interact and develop over time with economic relations, including migrant labour, remittances, trade and investment and food security, and the Yemen conflict being important pivot points. There's also reference to cross currents from climate change, including recent reports to the droughts in Ethiopia, Kenya and Somalia this year, affecting 30 million people, COVID-19 and changes to the international oil price, as well as economic diverse, diversification strategies that have had an impact. There's an awareness of the historic and structural issues involved, including the Hijrat or Muslim migration from Western Arabia to places such as Abyssinia, the Ethiopian empire, connectivities established by sailors, uh, conquerors, traders, and slaves crossing the Red Sea, and Arabs from Oman and the Arabian Peninsula who travelled across the Arabian Sea and Indian Ocean to what is now modern-day Mozambique, Kenya, and Tanzania. With chapters on international powers, Saudi Arabia, Iran, UAE economic statecraft, Turkey, Qatar, Turkey and the UAE, the Qatar crisis, Kuwait's historic and aid-centric role in West Africa as a comparative study, Djibouti, and relative autonomy in the Horn, and specifically in Sudan. We cover the gamut of international relations affecting this wide area. 
on international powers, it's interesting how colonization, US, Soviet and Russia relations, as well as Egypt and Israel relations, and indeed interactions within the GCC states continue to reverberate across the Horn, even in states such as Kenya and Ethiopia, which became more dominant at the end of the Cold War. China's Djibouti base from 2017 drew attention to Djibouti as a strategic state with other military bases such as Turkey's base in Mogadishu, which established, was established in the same year, also sparking discussions in policy circles. Russia's intentions vis-a-vis Port Sudan are also being closely watched, specifically with regard to what's happening now in Ukraine. Clearly, it's a fast-moving environment, but I believe that our findings hold up well and will continue to do so over the coming years. Uh, moving on to the chapters, um, start by talking about Saudi Arabia and Iran, and then after 10 minutes or so, we'll move on to um, others, including on econ UAE economic statecraft, on UAE Turkey relation, and then finishing with Simon talking about conceptual issues and the view uh, from the horn. So Saudi Arabia often points to King Faisal, who travelled across Africa during his reign from 1964 to 1975, and he set up the Saudi Fund for Development in 1974. Uh, Saudi economic support has been particularly pronounced in Sudan, Somalia, and in support of the Eritrean Liberation Front in the 60s. However, the Arab uprisings affected its calculations uh, more recently. The Yemen war meant that Saudi Arabia needed to shore up its southern and more in 2014, perhaps to cover weapons transfers to Yemen. In 2015, Saudi Arabia and the UAE secured various Horn state participation in the Saudi-led coalition in Yemen with both funding so hydrocarbon transfers. I'm sorry, we seem to have lost uh, Robert, who, who gave us a heads up uh, initially that his connection in Egypt might not be very reliable. Uh, but we had planned to, uh, just in case this happened, give the floor to Simon to continue the introduction. Uh, so Simon, um, uh, I'll give the floor to you um, if you'd like to continue where, where Robert left off or, uh, or, or any other way you'd like to proceed. Sure. Thanks, Raymond. I'll, I'll echo the thanks that, that Robert began with um, as he leaves the building and try not to tread too much on his, his toes. He's got a, a rather detailed overview of, of the book that I don't want to, to wade too much into, but perhaps I can use this as a chance just to, to thank everyone for, for coming and to thank our, our wonderful contributors for their, their really insightful contributions to, to this volume. Uh, conceptually, it was a really interesting project to, to work on with regard to these two um, independent yet overlapping... Ah, Robert, welcome back. Um, I was just setting up the, the conceptual um, regional security complexes that become interrelated. But if you're back, please, your historical uh, overview is far more valuable right now. <laughs> well, thanks for, for covering. I'm not sure how far I got into my, uh, my Saudi uh, summary. Um, pick it up maybe from, we get to the Arab Rising, Simon? And Assab? No. King, King Fessel. King Fessel. Okay, I didn't get very far then. All right, well, I'll take it back a step. Hopefully I'll get a, a, a second bite of the apple here. Um, okay, so the Arab uprisings affected the calculations of Saudi Arabia and the Horn. Uh, the Yemen war meant Saudi Arabia needed to shore up its southern and western flanks. Uh, Iran established a Gulf of Aden anti-piracy anti task force in 2014, uh, perhaps as a cover for its uh, weapon transfers into, into uh, Yemen. In 2015, Saudi Arabia and the Emirates secured various Horn state participation in the coalition in Yemen uh, with funding and hydrocarbon. For example, in Eritrea, Saudi Arabia established a GCC base at Assab, which ended Iran's naval access and what was could be seen as alleged weapons uh, conduit uh, through Assab to Sudan and Egypt going north into Hamas in Gaza. And also concerns that that same link from Assad was uh, being conducted, the weapons were being conducted across to the Houthis in Yemen. Uh, in 2018, Saudi Arabia and the UAE took leading roles in negotiating between uh, Ethiopia and Eritrea. In the case of the kingdom, it provided a billion dollars uh, to the Ethiopian Central Bank in the lead up to the 2018 peace deal, so significant economic connections there. 
Uh, Saudi Arabia may be more cautious going forward in light of Turkish inroads into Ethiopia through soft power, such as popularity of Turkish television shows, trade and development aid. Ethiopia is particularly important uh, as it has the second largest population in Africa. It's home to the African Union and is really a regional power. Um, it's also engaged in constructing the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam, which threatens Egyptian national security interests and therefore its relations with Saudi Arabia and the Emirates in particular. So there's a, a fair amount of triangulation of foreign policy going on. Djibouti also cut diplomatic relations with Iran in 2016, losing Tehran a symbolic presence near US Camp Limonia and other international bases. Uh, for nearly three decades, Sudan and, and Iran had a close diplomatic, economic and military relationship. Omar al-Bashir and Hassan al-Turabi refused to participate in the Gulf War to expel Iranian forces from Kuwait, offered Osama bin Laden sanctuary after he was stripped of Saudi citizenship and refused to recognize Saudi Arabia's ulama making Sudan a pariah state. Only from 1993 did Omar al-Bashir um, attempt to repair relations and sought greater funding from the GCT in return. Sudan closed Iranian cultural centers and expelled a diplomat in 2014 over fears of um, proselytizing and possibly in hope of more Saudi investment. Khartoum completely severed ties with Iran in 2016 after the storming of the Saudi embassy in Tehran. Uh, Sudanese troops have been active in Yemen since 2015, but were scaled back in 2020 amid a wider drawdown of forces. After the popular 2019 coup ousting al-Bashir and the military coup in 2021 led by General Fatah al-Burhan, the stakes remain high for Saudi Arabia and the Emirates in ma maintaining stability through support of the military elite. Uh, beyond, uh, beyond Saudi real politique in Somalia, an important livestock import for the Hajj, which are adversely affected by COVID-19, highlighting the necess necessity for diversification in this industry, the uh, Emirates and Turkish engagement has been far more evident. Overall, there remains potential in Saudi Arabia encouraging balancing with more upfront economic and energy resources. But as the Kingdom focuses on Vision 2030 and seeks closure to the Yemen conflict, Saudi interest looks set to be focused increasingly through economic channels, mega projects, uh, potential new connections such as the causeway across the Tehran Strait to Egypt, um, perhaps far more likely in the north compared to the bridge of the Horn of Africa, which was proposed between Djibouti and Yemen. But also diplomatic engagements forums such as the Red Sea Forum, which really focused on addressing shared security threats uh, between um, the states. Uh, lying on the Red Sea. The Iranian ambition in the Horn has not been met with significant traction. There's been attempts to boost Iranian standing uh, and African support for Iran in the United Nations during the Ahmadinejad presidency. There's been allegations of import of Uranium ore, which were not covered by UN Security Council sanctions in 2006. And these have been connected to Tanzania in 2006 and Zimbabwe in 2013. Not horn specific, but certainly uh, related to wider Iranian engagement in Africa. As Eric Lorb, a co um, contributor to this volume, notes, uh, Iran's Ministry of Construction, Jihad, has helped Iran gain influence through agricultural development programs in African states such as Tanzania, Ghana, Sudan, and Sierra Leone. But generally, in the horn, Tehran doesn't have the economic resources to compete. However, the death knell for its influence in the Horn has really been a combination of pragmatic local political elites seeking to balance their interests, a lack of social Shia affiliation. So, for example, 8% of Shia in uh, Kenya, 2% in Ethiopia, 2% in Djibouti, very low figures compared to the Sunni populations. And Saudi Arabia's golden opportunity to extend its alliances in the Horn uh, following the execution of, of uh, Nimr al-Nimr in the kingdom and the Iranian uh, storming of the embassy in the Saudi embassy in Tehran. What I would say is that this competition, not only uh, Saudi-Iranian competition, but also involving the Emirates, Qatar and Turkey, can be highly destabilizing contrary to regionalism, which may be more effective at securing economic development in the Horn and the relative autonomy of its constituent states. Uh, I think the issue with the, uh, the cattle exports uh, during the COVID period uh, is, is one uh, example of that. 
But there's also limited capacity and scope for multilateral institutions such as the Intergovernmental Authority on Development, IGAD, to operate amid divergent state agendas, notably Ethiopia and Djibouti during the Somali peace process, state collapse and political contestation in Somalia, civil war in Darfur, civil war in Tigray, and fragile Eritrea-Ethiopia relations. At least the growing roster of external actors uh, with promises of local development, military training and base agreements enhance the sense of relative autonomy among these horn states. Now, I'd like to pass over to um, Karen Young, who will discuss UAE economic engagement. Thank you very much. Thank you, Robert, and uh, thanks to AGSIW for the welcome and, and the opportunity to talk about this book, um, and Robert and Simon for editing the book and putting it together. Um, I wanted to just take a step back and, and start off with some remarks about the process of uh, you know, doing an edited volume, especially one like this that takes years really to get from a workshop or a conference paper to a published book, and in this case, you know, during the pandemic. So there are 11 chapters in the book. I have one chapter along with my co-author, uh, Tamer Khan. Um, and, you know, for those of us who work in the policy space, doing academic work and, you know, waiting for publication, inevitably the reality on the ground changes. Um, and so what we studied in 2018 and saw in the shifts in outside influence in the Horn through investment, aid, uh, new sources and new kind of mechanisms of uh, financial intervention, um, I think has now changed again. And I think the, the frank answer is that it's become more about um, the uh, ability to exert influence through, uh, through military um, assistance, particularly the transfer of drone technology. Um, and so that's, you know, that's part of a learning curve, right? And the patterns that you recognize and study as a political scientist are, you know, are bound to shift. And so we started this project, as, um, as Robert said, at the Gulf Research Meeting, I think that was 2019, but I'm not even really sure. Um, and the chapter I wrote with, with Tamar Khan was also a product of collaboration that, uh, that we had at AGSIW when I was a, a senior resident scholar there and Tamar was a, a non-resident scholar. And he did some really interesting field work which AGSIW funded um, to Somalia, Djibouti and Ethiopia. Um, and then that work I took when I left AGSIW to AEI and uh, the Smith Richardson Foundation funded a three-year project um, collecting data on foreign direct investment, on um, aid and other sources of financial intervention, the central bank deposits that Robert mentioned, um, as well as really the role of, of, uh, of state-owned enterprises and state funds. And so that project now has turned into a different book, um, a, a single author manuscript, a book that I have coming out this year. Um, and so it's, it's really, I think, interesting to think about how these collaborations happen, um, how we manage through the pandemic, but how important it is to, um, you know, to kind of rely on the concepts that we're developing. Um, and, you know, I've been writing about the UAE as emerging interventionist since 2013. So, you know, 10 years on, how does that interventionism change in its shape and its scope and its aspirations? Um, and then theoretically, you know, it's one thing to describe it. And many, many scholars have been talking about sort of the rise of the Gulf and the Gulf moment, Gulfization. Um, but more importantly, I think, is to ask the question of why, what motivates these policies? Um, and how are those policies made? And so I think the output and the product of that early research now in this chapter, one of 11, it may seem dated, but it's also, I think, an academic exercise of process tracing, right? And so the process that we describe and try to theorize a bit is economic statecraft. Um, it's also about arms sales of new allies, of clientelism. Um, and you know this, this, these effects of influence, which began as I think a financial source of support to regional governments, commitments of FDI, central bank support, is really now evolved more into uh, military sales and, and gifting and operational support, I would say, and some very serious conflicts and changes of power that we're seeing across Ethiopia, Eritrea and Sudan. Mm -hmm. um, and so while you know, my work is really focused on the economic side of that Gulf influence, um, uh, you know, I've been studying the amount, the announcements, the delivery, the effects in job creation, the effects in sort of local economic growth in these recipient states. 
Um, and the, and the new book really is, is uh, the product of, of three years of that, of that work. So the title of the chapter in this book is Extended States, The Politics and Purpose of UAE Economic Statecraft and the Horn. Um, and that notion of, of being extended or overextended, really the question of state capacity, I think is really important as we you know, begin and, and continue to study um, you know, the way that the Gulf states see their you know, one term is sphere of influence, but the way they kind of operationalize their foreign policies in, you know, in this kind of circle around them, which extends across MENA to Pakistan, to the Horn, um, and why. Um, and in the chapter, there's a good bit on Ethiopia. There's reference to Egypt, of course, to Sudan, uh, Djibouti, and Somalia. And my co-author, Tamar Khan, really focused more on the basing, on ports, um, and, and as I said, did some really interesting on the ground work uh, in, in Somaliland. We conceptualized this shift in Gulf political economy and out for, outward influence, um, both the military and economic side, um, as part of a larger shift in global politics out of unipolarity. So everybody's talking about this now, but you know, five, six years ago, it wasn't so, even three years, it was still kind of a new idea. And I think we're seeing why that matters and the specific pressures it's created uh, you know, within the US GCC relationships for one, um, and pressures too on new partnerships with authoritarian capitalist states, Russia and China. Um, so the world has really changed since we began this project. Um, and you know the the kind of notion of Gulfization is now one that I think scholars and policymakers have to pay a lot more attention to, and that includes not just these economic and military resources and projections of of state identity and power, but these kind of aspirational and cultural shifts too, which is really very much a domestic politics story. Um, so our chapter tries to ask why, what motivates the UAE and other GCC states to try and change themselves and the world around them? Um, you know, and, and we ask specifically, what are the motivations of the expansionist, interventionist foreign economic policy and security posture of the UAE? Um, and we use two kind of, you know, well-known academic concepts to explore that, one complex realism and the other, the concept of economic statecraft. Um, one of the kind of findings is that the, from the UAE perspective, from the UAE state point of view, is the notion of value for money, right? And so we also saw a lot of reversals in um, investment and aid commitments over time. Um, and so, you know, the kind of decision-making you see allows very fast moving and pivoting policy choices um, within the Gulf states, within the UAE in particular, that of course we don't see in Western political economies. We don't move or enact policy in the same way. Another consideration that I think defines UAE economic statecraft and engagement and intervention in its surrounding um, area of influence is you know, asking two questions. What do we need? and what is within our reach and that sort of constant recalibration of those questions. So in terms of what do we need, that can mean uh, food security, which has motivated a lot of Gulf um, activity in the Horn for many, many years, that's increased. But then a more important conceptualization of what might we need, what might we need in the future in terms of a, you know, a middle-class consumer base for our products, for petroleum products, for petrochemical products, and that's why uh, a large population like Ethiopia's and Egypt's um, to a degree becomes so important. Um, some of the pullback I think is now really important to study, particularly on the economic side. So in 2018, we saw this influx of capital, particularly to Ethiopia and from the Gulf states, but also from the United States. The United States was the most important source of capital expenditure into Ethiopia in 2018. And in two, you know, Four years since then, it's largely just completely collapsed, right? And so we're seeing those effects in uh, right now in the war economy of, the, of Ethiopia and its potential for what we saw as a very important growth story in the Horn now really diminished. Um, I think it's also worth considering how things have changed since we wrote about the UAE and its influence in, in the rapprochement between Eritrea and Ethiopia, um, really, which sort of was catapulted by needs from the conflict and the war in Yemen in 2000, starting in 2015, um, and then kind of getting momentum uh, in 2018. Um, and this has really shifted in composition and, and amounts, 
So here's just some, you know, kind of data points to hold in mind. So the surge in, in capital expenditure or foreign direct investment from the U.S. Uh, surge into Ethiopia in 2018, um, Chinese investment has declined. GCC investment, most all of it from the UAE, surged in 2018 and 2019. Um, and on average, between 2014 and 2020, support from and, and investment support from the UAE and the GCC as a whole, led by the UAE, really was nearly parallel or equal to that of what China invested in Ethiopia between those six years, 14 to 2020. Um, though the Chinese investment was more of a source of job creation, but I would argue um, low-skilled jobs. But since 2020, if we look at the capex from the UAE that's gone into Ethiopia, it's completely fallen off. Since February 2020, we've seen no new investments. And the investments that did go in, those last ones, one was Sanad, which was uh, basically a, um, an investment in airlines and aerospace, basically a big sort of manufacturing and logistics hub um, at the Addis uh, airport. We don't see any other projects like that, which shows the kind of ability to turn on a heel and also kind of a loss of interest or you know, value for money in that proposition of the growth story. Interestingly, continued FDI from the UAE into the Horn, um, excluding Egypt, which is resurged again as a point of, uh, of financial intervention. Sudan has been more of a constant recipient. Um, and so, you know, if you look at the vehicles used to deliver that support, the most important one has been from a large holding company, IHC, which is an um, international holding company based in Abu Dhabi. It's a listed company. But 74% of the company is owned by Royal Group, which is essentially headed by Sheikh Tanun, the National Security Advisor of the UAE. So you can see how security interests through financial vehicles, state-owned largely, um, financial vehicles then become mechanisms of support, which is still a tool that's very much in use in the horn, which we saw test case, I would say, in Ethiopia, well, first in Egypt, and then in Ethiopia, and now very much in Sudan. And so if you look at the kinds of projects that are being invested in, um, it's interesting, they're um, still very much in the kind of real estate sphere, um, uh, Emirates Stallions Group, which is a subsidiary of IHC, and also in food. So still that kind of lingering interest in the region as a source of food security. Um, so, you know, those are just some examples, which I say when we do our process tracing of this kind of intervention of these tools of economic statecraft, those processes evolve and shift. Sometimes they draw back. Sometimes there are, you know, value for money considerations. And then more often now, I think we're seeing the deployment on, um, on security rationales um, and security rationales for um, not just the delivery of investment into strategic sectors, but also of those security tools themselves. Um, and UAVs, I think, being the most important in kind of turning the tide of, of regional conflict and, and support for, uh, for certain governments. I'll stop there. Thank you. Umar, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Uh, and thanks to both of you for uh, including my work in this very interesting volume connecting the whole of Africa with, with Gulf, uh, uh, Gulf states and broader Middle East. So the idea of the, the chapter was uh, uh, to elucidate on uh, political and security linkages of Turkey and the UAE, uh, particularly with, with the whole of African uh, Africa states. Uh, but I also tried to develop uh, a sort of a theoretical uh, framework that can better explain how the broader engagement between the Middle Eastern uh, countries and the Horn of Africa uh, is plotting out. So the idea was uh, to, to, to coin uh, this theoretical understanding of interregional embedded security, a model of an interregional inter embedded security uh, by exploring regional security complex of the Horn and complication from the impact of external actors um, from the Middle Eastern regional security complex. So uh, we, if we see broader patterns of engagement uh, by uh, the two pr principal actors here, Turkey and UAE, Turkey has been, you can say, uh, more centered on economic uh, 
statecraft, particularly economic statecraft, and uh, its center of focus has been uh, in uh, Somalia. If we talk about broader horn, Turkish uh, involvement in Somalia has also generated greater dividends for Turkish soft power. Uh, gradually, the Turkish uh, presence in the form of humanitarian aid and investment has helped uh, the rejuvenation of the Somali economy. And subsequently, Turkey's presence in Somalia has also uh, helped it uh, impacting upon the Somali security infrastructure because now Turkey is training a huge amount of uh, Somali uh, security forces, both within Turkey and also within within uh, Mogadishu, within Somalia. And uh, it, it it happened at a time when none of the international actors were really willing to go deep down into into Somalia, uh, especially the Mogadishu outside Mogadishu airport. So Turkey was one of that uh, actor that first moved and then has gotten the mileage of um, the political dividends of the first mover. Uh, also, uh, you can say that uh, this. Uh, uh, this involvement of Turkey has uh, created a sort of an economic dependence within Somalia upon Turkey. Similarly, Turkey has been involved in Sudan. Uh, it was close to the former Sudanese president, Omar al-Bashir. They tried to uh, get a deal on the Suakin Island so it can function as a naval uh, docking base for, for Turkish warships. That, that would have uh, created a stronger... Uh, uh, created a uh, room for Turkish security or naval presence within uh, within the Horn of Africa uh, in multiple points, in addition to Mogadishu. And because at that time, Turkish relationship with the, uh, the UAE, which is the other principal security, uh, you can say, influencer vis-a-vis uh, -vis Horn, was not uh, very good and they were actually competing for political space. So that would have been uh, quite a development, but the removal of uh, Omar al-Bashir and uh, uh, his uh, him being replaced by rather pro UAE and pro uh, Saudi forces uh, has essentially uh, dampened that whole uh, project. Uh, maybe there can be some uh, some some hints of it being restored while. Now the relationship is getting back to back to normal, but um, it, it looks a little bit uh, difficult now. Turkey has also been involved in Ethiopia, uh, mostly in um, uh, the railway sector. Additionally, the Zirat Bank has a uh, presence in, in, Turkey, uh, in Ethiopia. But I would say that uh, recently, Turkish engagement has really uh, reached a new level when um, uh, Turkey supplied the Pirat uh, drones. They played a very important role in the um, in in the defense of Addis Ababa, but also taking back the offensive uh, to the Tigray forces in the current, if we say, Ethiopian civil war. And uh, it won't be wrong to say that uh, Turkish drones and drone power uh, contributed towards uh, contributed uh, uh, in. Uh, stabilizing the situation on behalf of Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed and uh, his political survival, his military survival pretty much uh, is due to this Turkish, uh, you can say, support. Um, also, there are, I mean, over the years, uh, this Turkish engagement has also drawn some, uh, you can say, uh, strong uh, reactions from from the horn as well. So although we can see a pattern of uh, the involvement of Turkey within horn uh, into issues that are very much organic or inherent uh, of horn's own politics uh, or conflicts that are based within horn and not being, uh, you can say, uh, imported from outside, but Turkish influence or Turkish presence or Turkish support has impacted upon these different, uh, you can say, uh, these different files. <clears throat> and uh, that has led to some strong uh, backlash, specifically in the prime focus of Turkey is, uh, you can say, investments and um, uh, political influence, which is Somali <coughs> Somalia. So Turkish uh, support for the Somali president, uh, for Majo, and uh, his uh, in, uh, attempts to, to to stay in power uh, even after his uh, political mandate was expired, this has resulted uh, 
into a lot of uh, Somalis questioning the real intentions of Turkey, because uh, in a way, Turkey is uh, giving lease of life to Fermajo and uh, the forces which are trained by Turkey have been, uh, they have been alleged to be working as uh, mercenaries for, for the current Somali president. Also, the Turkish, we must say, when we talk about Somalia, the Turkish influence or Turkish engagement remains limited to Mogadishu. So other um, uh, federal Somali states, they, they are more, uh, you can say, under the wings of uh, UAE as such and not uh, Turkey. So, but in a way, uh, this engagement with Formaggio, um, it, it does create uh, political complications, uh, both within the Somali politic, uh, political affair, but also within, within Mogadishu. So quickly now, I'll just move on to uh, UAE's role, although uh, Karen has uh, uh, gone uh, in detail about it, but I'll just say that uh, some of the strategic goals of UAE have remote, were traditionally more security, or, uh, security oriented because UAE at the same time was present uh, on the other side of, of the Red Sea in, in Yemen. So it made sense for them to acquire strategic bases uh, uh, on the Horn side, uh, which can then function as uh, uh, logistics, you can say, uh, force multipliers uh, and also uh, for broader logistical uh, support. Uh, and uh, we have seen this changing, but uh, still the Amarati, you can say, uh, presence in uh, in the Barbara port uh, of Somaliland, it's still there, although it's now becoming more civilian rather than security, security oriented. Other than that, uh, of course, the Emirates was very uh, much involved in uh, mediation activities within the Horn of Africa. So again, in a way, the Emirates played uh, a very interesting role in in influencing the political dynamics of, of the Horn, uh, the dynamics which were very much, uh, uh, which very much originate within the Horn or are from the Horn and not uh, essentially are, um, uh, you can say, a story, a replication of the uh, Cold War dynamics. So the, the key episode of this was the, the Amarati mediation between the leaderships of Eritrea and uh, Ethiopia, which led to the signing of uh, a joint accord between the two leaderships. Uh, and actually, the accord was finalized in, in Riyadh. So the UAE was mindful that uh, uh, it must bring uh, in its uh, partner within uh, political partner within the Arabian Peninsula into this uh, activity. And um, so the idea of uh, tracing, uh, uh, tracing these political and security linkages was basically to, to, to develop into uh, or to, to conclude conceptually, what does it mean in terms of the security engagement between uh, the broader Middle Eastern regional security complex and uh, the Horn of Africa, uh, you can say uh, regional security. So from a Barry Buzan perspective, Horn of Africa is not a fully developed uh, regional security complex. It's a rather um, uh, in a stage of uh, pre uh, uh, regional security complex, but there are other authors, um, uh, Horn authors like Peruk Mesfin, who argued against that there are very clear patterns of enmity, enmity within within Horn of Africa. But over the time, because of changes in political geography of uh, Horn, uh, increased um, civil uh, conflict within Horn Straits and their dependence upon external actors for uh, financial and economic purposes. Uh, we, can, we can argue that there has uh, been some sort of a dependence that has developed uh, within Horn on extra regional actors. And we have clearly seen over the past years, uh, both in the political and in the security fold, uh, Middle Eastern actors fulfilling this uh, this this gap so that's why uh, i think that uh, uh, the 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 idea of so uh, of how not being a regional security complex but also exhibiting characteristics of a regional security complex and whether we should consider it uh, as a subordinate to the extended middle eastern regional security complex they really uh, these ideas re really need to be questioned so then, so that's uh, the conclusion of this work remains that 
both regions have security interaction and are developing a level of political, economic and defense partnership, which is then gradually giving birth to a model of an inter-regional embedded security complex. And this new model of inter-regional embedded security takes into account both the very root causes of conflicts within Horn of Africa. Uh, so the conflicts are not an extension of competition or uh, confrontation outside of the Horn, but they are very much within Horn. And they're impacting upon its security atmosphere, but also how these conflicts have been influenced by the political, economic, and security agendas of Middle Eastern political entities, in this case specifically UAE and Turkey. So this increased strategic presence of Middle Eastern actors in the Horn compels us to theoretically no longer treat Horn as an isolated political system and as it will, uh, um, and we do, and thus the Middle Eastern regional security complex do have sufficient impact on the happenings uh, in uh, within the broader Horn. So for now, we can say that this new security model gives us an ontological balance to the debate derived from Buzan's region security complex theory and its uh, uh, contestations originating from uh, different other uh, scholars, but subject to the further weakening of localized actors as we have seen uh, in Ethiopia, in Sudan, and even to some extent in um, uh, Somalia, there are and there would be even greater opportunities for Middle Eastern actors to extend their political capital within the whole. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Uma, for those uh, um, thoughts and insights. Um, what you were saying on the conceptual side, I think there's a nice segue into um, some more conceptual points which Simon might, might want to make. Uh, as well as dwelling on uh, issues and uh, points raised from the sort of Horn uh, states from their perspective. So over to you, Simon. Thank you. Thanks, Robert. And thanks, Uma, for taking up many of the points that I was going to make already. So uh, much appreciated. Um, I must begin by apologizing for any incoherence. I'm currently um, recovering from COVID and I'm in the midst of brain fog and all of the, the, the hellish confusion that that entails. So um, I guess we have to add that to, uh, to my normal incoherence, but I'll try my best. Um, in all seriousness, though, um, this has been a really interesting project to, to work on, and it's been a great pleasure to work with Robert um, and all of our wonderful contributors. Uh, there's, there's a lot of rich empirical material that's come out of the, the various chapters, as Karen and Uma have just highlighted. They're two of the, the, the real gems in the book, but there are so many other nuggets that are well worth your time. So hopefully that 40% off voucher will get working soon enough. But the the stuff that really grabs my attention here is that the conceptual and the conceptual discussions that the Doom has just been alluding to. And I think what's what's of interest here are, are questions about the interplay of different regions but also um, the manifestation of, of questions of security and order. Now, if we look at the, the, the work of Barry Bazan and Ollie Weaver and others within the English school who talk about these types of debates, you would get the sense that there is a, a regional security complex and then maybe different incarnations of sub-regional security complexes or sub-sub-regional security complexes. But I, I find that particularly problematic in this case of relations between the Horn and the Gulf. Um, and I find it in some ways sort of verging on the xenophobic or perhaps even the Orientalist with regard to a denial of agency in the Horn, as in this sense that the Horn is just the playground of the rich Gulf states and the denial of, of local agency in the Horn. And what the book does, I think, really nicely in the empirical chapters is highlights the, the levels of agency that, that states in the Horn have vis-a-vis -vis their, their counterparts in the Gulf. And so what we, what we end up having are two independent regional security complexes that are also interrelated. And it's that interplay between independence and interdependence that helps define the nature of relations between the Gulf and the Horn. And I think that's where the really interesting stuff comes out of the book empirically and conceptually. And this is where one of the, the main claims and the, the, one of the strengths of the book is in that 
we have a range of excellent chapters that articulate how local actors in the Horn are capitalizing on the dynamics of golf politics for their own ends um, and using the, the complex interplay between the two different regional security complexes in pursuit of their own ends. And hopefully that was relatively clear. But what the book does in the grand scheme of things is tries to trace the ways in which dynamics within the Gulf regional security complex and the Horns regional security complex shape the actions of agents within each individual regional security complex and with regard to the other. And I think given the presence of shared, um, shared normative, religious, ethnic identities across both regional security complexes, there is this sense that developments in one complex will resonate in the other and vice versa. It, it goes back to some of the work of Paul Noble, who talks about the Middle East being this great sound chamber with ideas reverberating across borders. And I think we can extrapolate from that to say that ideas reverberate across different regional security complexes. But here, um, what's, what's particularly important, I think, is the interplay between different understandings of security and the interplay between the material and the ideational. And that we've got all of this really important work that Karen's done in her, in her chapter and her work more generally on the economic and the economic statecraft combined with Uma's work on, on more ontological questions of security, um, regional rivalries, the presence of, of shared religious identities, sectarian dynamics, ethnic uh, questions, and putting it all together gets this complex interplay that allows um, particular actors, and by actors I'm talking about states here, but I'm also talking about creative individuals, individuals who have that capacity to engage in um, sort of creative diplomacy to capitalize on the evolution of, um, of regional security complex politics and then the interplay between those different politics. And so what we see across the, 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 um, the book and the interplay between the different security complexes is the manifestation of um, of political calculations and political concerns in one playing out in the other. So, for instance, there's a lot of debate on, on Islamism and economic statecraft and the interplay between the two that stems from um, concerns in the Gulf. And this comes out, of course, post-2017 and, uh, um, and the, the Qatar blockade, but then also resonating across the, the horn, whereby local actors conscious of the need to meet various economic pressures and conscious of the need to circumvent their own regional rivalries, cultivate relations with particular actors in the Gulf as a means of trying to circumvent those structural factors within their own regional security complex. And so this is where I think it's, it's really important to look at this, this complex interplay, not just in terms of bilateral Gulf security complex and Horn security complex, but as sort of malleable security complexes in flux that are constructed and reconstructed on a regular basis that, that we shouldn't just take a snapshot and, and view that as the nature of the security complex. These are, these are processes and complexes that evolve over time. And the evolution of these things are conditioned not only by the sort of the, the constituent parts and the evolution and the interaction of those constituent parts within the Gulf and within the Horn, but also the interplay between um, those constituent parts and the major powers, the superpowers, the, the, the international level. And that's something that, that Robert teases out in some of the earlier chapters of the book, um, that international actors have a, a key role to play both in the, in the actions of those uh, security complexes, but also then the interplay between the two different security complexes. And as a result of that, then, I think what we see with these, um, these different security complexes is a conceptual need to view uh, or, or to further explore the interplay between different complexes 
but also the need to triangulate with the, the various national, subnational and supranational pressures that states are under. And I think if we look at the Horn, we can see it as a, as a site of possibility for Gulf states, providing uh, opportunities for, for states in the GCC. Um, and conversely, that site of possibility is also a site of possibility for states in the Horn to circumvent their own domestic pressures and their own regional rivalries, playing out on the ways in which Gulf states are interacting with them, but also then global powers are interacting as well. And I think what's, what's really interesting here is that sometimes this works, this works nicely. And then in other times it doesn't work. Um, and there are some really good examples of, of this. Um, maybe the, the best example of the, the failure of some of these things is the Bridge of Horns, a construction project that was designed to cross the Bab el-Mandab, connecting the, the Arabian Peninsula and the Horn, um, that was supposed to desire to build two cities, um, combining around 7 million people. Hugely ambitious, of course, this struggled to get off the ground due to conflict, economic challenges, logistic, uh, logistical challenges, uh, and then some regional disparities that created political challenges, structural challenges, that meant it just wasn't really viable. So again, this is this sense that there are all these things that are, that are playing out live, in flux, and that are, I think, as specific manifestations of the complexities and contingencies of particular moments in time and space. And trying to capture all of that in a conclusion is quite challenging. And trying to capture all of it in a book is equally challenging. But I think what we've tried to do is, is flag up some of these key things that, that, that need to be explored further. And I think ensuring that we, we get a better understanding of the conceptual interplay between those two regional security complexes is really important, as is doing it in a way that allows a more nuanced and appropriate voice for, um, for, for states and actors from the horn, so they're not just subsumed into the, the machinations of their, their Gulf counterparts. And I think that's really important. And I think, Robert, that's where I should leave it. I think I've been talking about 10 minutes, so I'll leave it for over to you. Thanks. Thanks very much, Simon. Thanks. OK, that's great. So in terms of wrapping up um, what has been a very diverse and uh, integrated um, conversation on, on various aspects, economic, political, security, um, the civil conflicts taking place, the, the dynamics of climate change impacting and, yeah. and other scenarios as well. We've got a number of questions here. Um, which I think quite nicely cover uh, multiple chapters. So the first one asks about the um, the foreign powers and are uh, they attracted to the to the horn? Well, my 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 brief answer would be uh, yes. Particularly, I think at the moment Russia is very interested in, in Port Sudan, and that seems to be a continuation and a, an evaluation and calculations based on what's happening elsewhere. There's of course the colonial legacy, which. Uh, um, is, is, is apparent, especially with the French who've been uh, in, in the Horn for, for many, many years um, and other states besides. Um, but I, I think my answer also includes the fact that there's uh, this growing awareness of calculations based on, on the end. You know, what are you trying to achieve? And therefore, it's not necessarily Horn specific, but a wider regional calculations. For example, we've, we've heard about Chinese interest in the Gulf, for example, and, and how um, these, these waterways right through from Suez Canal to um, the Gulf of Aden and into the Gulf and uh, the Strait of Hormuz, for example, and the whole of the Indian Ocean is becoming much more attractive. The Russians have been interested in, in uh, getting uh, warm water uh, um, capacity or a base in, in warm waters uh, for many years, I think since, since the 19th century. I've been looking at this in my in my latest uh, book, which covers Russia. Um, and so it's an ongoing uh, competition, not only at the, at the regional level, which we've looked at in terms of the Gulf states, but also the international level as well, in terms of broader calculations, Indo-Pacific and so on. And it's one which is which is evolving 
uh, based on these shifting strategic calculations. Uh, I don't know if anyone else has any uh, uh, inputs into the international dimension there. Maybe just one point to, to raise, which is something to watch out for, and that's shifting US policy um, and questions about US capital. Um, speaking to, to, to folks in the Gulf, there's a growing sense that, that US political capital is on the wane. And if that's the case, then um, that could well provide structural opportunities for other actors to, to increase their influence, be it other actors on the international stage or indeed other actors with aspiring um, aspiring positions or aspiring to positions of influence, be they middle powers or aspiring regional hegemons. I think that, that sort of structural reimagining of global politics is, is quite important. Okay, thanks. Um, my second question here is um, on economic statecraft. Um, I think this is a good one for you, Karen, which asks whether uh, local actors have any economic statecraft capabilities against regional or international actors. So really an issue of, sort of relative autonomy um, at the, uh, the horn level. Yeah, I saw that question and I was a little bit confused by it. It seemed to be a, definitely more of a of the continent of Africa context. Was that... Um... Was that what, I don't know what the uh, person who asked it intended, um, but I would echo Simon's point that yes, of course, I mean, there is agency in um, in the states that are recipients of aid and recipients of investment. And and certainly this uh, this occurred during the, you know, the, the, um, the blockade and embargo of Qatar um, of kind of playing states off of each other. And certainly, I mean, Egypt is a fascinating case example of, of, uh, of you know, kind of the withdrawal of, of support and, um, and then the Egyptian government really continuing to do what it always did, which was, you know, use those kind of investments to funnel towards <laughs> state entities and, uh, and the military. And um, so, yes, I mean, there, there is that, um, that possibility. Um, but if you don't mind, I'd like to reflect a little bit more on Simon's point on the question of, um, you know, how the international system and the kind of uh, the departure from unipolarity affects countries in the Horn and countries in the Gulf and how they're seeing, you know, opportunities perhaps for, um, you know, realignments or, or maneuvering. And one thing that I think is becoming clear in the Gulf in light of the Russian invasion of Ukraine um, is the risk of isolation and the risk of financial exclusion. And I think that actually this plays into the interest of the United States and to uh, Western powers and to those of us that defend the liberal economic order, right? Um, that, that there is definitely a, a moment to consider the cost of stepping outside of bounds and, and the real um, cost of sanctions. In Ethiopia, this is a, a pertinent decision for, um, for Abi's government, they risk U.S. sanctions, uh, you know, in continuing the war and not allowing a, a humanitarian corridor to to the north. Um, and so there are real lessons now of you know the cost of that um, and what that means for your investment climate. Um, and certainly the economic cost of the war in Ethiopia now is 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 extreme. So you know, I mean, that's a convoluted way of saying there is a lot of learning going on. Um, in the recipient states and also of those states, particularly Gulf states that have expanded their capacity for financial intervention over the last decade. Um, so they are, I would say, moving more quickly and acknowledging the power when they work together. So just in the last week, the UAE in, in coordination with Qatar and Saudi Arabia have committed $25 billion to Egypt. Will they deliver $25 billion? No but they've done it together in cohesion when four years ago, this would have been absolutely out of the question, right? And so there's power in that grouping, there's power in partnering also with the IMF in that way. And there's power on the recipient side for the Egyptian government to say, hey, we need you all and come to the table and it makes you look good too. Um, and so I think that that learning is also transferring and, and will inform some of the choices that I hope we'll see um, in the horn, particularly in, in the Ethiopian context soon. Okay, great. On, on a related note, um, there's a question about whether the, this intra-GCC or GCC Turkish 
um, projects in Africa. Maybe Ulma can come in on this and uh, explain what's what's been going on. I know I think India and maybe the Emirates are doing something in terms of IT, but uh, interested to find out what other projects there might be. Yeah, it's, I think it's a it's a very interesting question. Like uh, because before. Uh, the Middle Eastern broader uh, political sphere was dominated by this Turkish Emirati or Emirati Saudi and Turkish Qatar uh, rivalry, but now this uh, has of course changed. So can they can they uh, develop some coherent strategy in terms of their dealings with the Horn of Africa? I, I don't think so. That there is like a, a blockwise coherent strategy uh, strategy uh, strategy right now being pursued. And also the interests of uh, different states are quite different uh, within the Horn. So Turkey definitely has um, uh, an, has an, something economic on its mind because it's not only Somalia, but its engagement with African countries is, has grown really, really extensively. There was an Africa summit in Turkey and uh, some people have actually compared the, the Turkish ambitions to possibly China. So Turkey is emerging as um, an overall a very big uh, economic actor within the broader African continent, uh, not only just uh, within Horn. But yes, we can say that there can be increased uh, coordination and cooperation when it comes to individual files within within Horn of Africa. We have seen like uh, Turkey, Turkey, the Emirates, and even Iran, they were all uh, backing the forces of uh, Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed in uh, Ethiopia and their, uh, their own respective, uh, you can say, uh, interventions or support for uh, Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed were quite decisive uh, in uh, stabilizing the front lines, but even taking the war against uh, the Tigray uh, rebels. So that was, in a way, we can say this was the first episode of uh, a relatively uh, quasi uh, GCC Turkey uh, coordination in terms of horn. Uh, but on the other hand, we do see uh, split uh, resonating or uh, sustaining in, in Somalia. So there was another question that if um, Turkey is siding with Permajo, the Somali president, what about the UAE? So yeah, it's quite clear that the UAE has very good contacts uh, with the Somali prime minister. And uh, the Somali prime minister wanted um, Somalia to return uh, some of the money they had con confiscated from the Marathi officials uh, on uh, uh, on the international airport when they were uh, getting into the countries. But Fermajo has apparently declined that. So these sort of, again, uh, localized uh, political dynamics, they do contribute towards uh, uh, extra regional engagement. But overall, you can say the uh, intra uh, inter uh, Middle Eastern uh, political competition thing getting exported into into Horn and Horn clients uh, manipulating that it certainly has been reduced and there is more you can say coordination whether it is Sudan whether it is uh, Ethiopia even with Djibouti so yeah there there is, there is definitely movement on the GCC Turkish. Uh, collective uh, engagement, but but not in a systemic manner, not in a really orderly fashion. Okay, thanks, Uma. Um, there's another question here on the Robert, security. can I just I... come in on that? Sorry. Yeah, sure. Um, just because I think when we're talking about India as well, um, there's, there's an additional layer of complexity that starts to come out when we think about one of the reasons for India's involvement in the Horn. Um, and that relates to Indian security concerns, notably with regard to China. And so that, again, points to this, this multi-tiered, multi-level analysis of, of the construction of, of, of an interplay of regional security complexes. So India's got this long and complex security rivalry, political rivalry with, with China for, uh, for, for many reasons, which we can't really go into here. And... China's Belt and Road um, actions, which which many are far more qualified than I am to talk about, have led it into into various areas that that India is trying to find new partners, new relationships to um, to to try and, and and address this rivalry. And so the the burgeoning relationship that India has with Abu Dhabi, with the UAE, allows it to to try and work together particularly in the Horn, to counter 
or at least monitor Chinese actions. So there is that additional security aspect in addition to all of the economic and the political um, dynamics. What's interesting is that India doesn't really have any official relationship with Somaliland and yet is heavily involved in, um, in the development of a port with the UAE there. Just one extra point to tag on to that is I think India is very interested, I mean, it has a very similar model to the Emirates in some ways, of enmeshing and creating and enhancing economic uh, development and opportunity uh, through partnerships and monetizing that partnerships, having these joint ventures. And whether it's a joint venture with the Gulf states in the horn to extend its influence, or whether it's a joint venture actually in India itself to, to build up capacity and uh, development, I think these two things go hand in hand. It's just about building uh, alliances and, and opportunity, economic opportunity. Um, so as I say, the security relations in the in Somaliland, someone's got a, a question about that. As, as far as I'm concerned, a lot of it hinges on the uh, economic uh, development side with uh, and the economic relations with the Emirates. Um, the, the fact that they're close neighbors uh, to the Gulf, to the GCC states, and the um, and the case of the Berbera port, which is, is rapidly uh, developed under, under the uh, under uh, UAE uh, cooperation. Maybe uh, Karen wants to discuss more on the uh, on the economic side how that's going. With respect to um, Somaliland, yeah. Well, I wish Tamer was here because he would have a better uh, a better view on. Uh, you know, he visited. Um, Berbera and he visited a number of the ports and and I've been to the port in, in Asab, but um, you know, there's some, yeah, I mean, I, I think the expectations of what these would be are now diminished, right? In terms of their commercial capacity, um, they're, they're smaller than perhaps some people anticipated or expected. Um, and, you know, given there's a whole lot of volatility and uncertainty in, 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 where we go and in, in those kind of um, as trade routes, but also in terms of the willingness to extend, uh, you know, a military position there, I, I would not see them as, as really emerging as, as much, much larger or important right now. Let's see. Um, there was a point in the, in the chat uh, from Neil Patrick, which I, I think he does, he makes an important observation um, that we're not really seeing a coherent strategic horn policy um, from the Gulf states, particularly from the Emiratis and the Saudis, um, given limitations of their own kind of naval naval power, which is you know well known, um, and some political caution. And I, I think that's correct. I think you know what. I think really again, Egypt was sort of the learning case after two thousand eleven and then thirteen, in terms of how much you want to extend economic support. Um, how much you're willing to put on the line and what you get in return for it. Um, and then the intervention in Ethiopia and Sudan from 2018 to 2020, um, I think it is becoming much more targeted and tactical in the way, particularly that the UAE is willing to extend um, investment support and then um, and, and military equipment support. They're not really putting, um, certainly not formal alliances or, you know, uh, uh, a security guarantee in these uh, in these states in the Horn. They're not willing to do so. Um, and as their own kind of uh, engagement in Yemen was drawn back in the summer of 2019, there was less of a necessity for having those physical locations and basing. Um, uh, but you know, the learning that happened there was that it's not hard to build it up quickly. And these are very kind of low maintenance type installations. Um, and if you have the kind of commercial foothold in some of the port facilities, that allows you to then ramp up if needed. But you don't necessarily need to maintain a large um, uh, kind of presence um, and, and pay for a large presence. And the other learning is that it's relatively cheap to come in and gain um, a political ear um, in, in the horn. Um, and so, you know, and that's been done 
I think fluidly and 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 uh, easily in some places, and with snafus and and kind of um, embarrassing um, transfers of of money in other places. So I mean, th these are these are tools that are you know being sharpened, and um, and we'll see them I think being exploited again, but perhaps more cautiously. Um, Robert, can I just make a point here uh, that? Uh, security-oriented or defense-oriented statecraft has actually been uh, sort of a uh, um, uh, celebration of, of Turkey, Turkey's uh, engagement in, in Africa. So probably we can see Turkey going, uh, upping its uh, security game more with regards to Horn and some other places because they have done this successfully in Libya, in Azerbaijan, and now uh, to some extent in Ethiopia. So probably that uh, maybe not uh, the Gulf due to their own military and naval limitations, but possibly Turkey can be an actor to look into. Right. And I think what's interesting is also going back to Karen's point about how it's relatively cost effective to gain a foothold in some of these uh, states. To look at um, the work of Alex Duval and uh, his political marketplaces, because when you are having a constant uh, negotiation for political influence uh, internally, um, to to uh, be accommodating to that kind of of realpolitik or economic statecraft, uh, I think it is a key is a key um, point, and it it, it, it complements very well this kind of approach being taken by the Gulf states at this point in time, and the fact that uh, it hinges perhaps on the uh, degree of uh, security concern so and what can be achieved so that billion dollars paid to ethiopia to achieve a peace deal um far outweighs perhaps some of its other economic engagement saudi economic engagement at least in in other theaters uh, which can only uh, amount to some millions of dollars in, in terms of its trade relation with somalia for example so it, it varies considerably uh, across the horn um Staying on uh, UAE economic statecraft, there's a question about which specific uh, Emirati figures are involved in its uh, interactions in the Horn. I, I think uh, Tanun, Sheikh Tanun was, uh, was mentioned already in terms of his um, holding companies and so on. Are there any other sort of key figures, obviously, apart from the sort of top leadership, which, uh, which you might point to, Karen? Well, I would I would actually talk more in terms of institutional capacity. So, you know, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and its uh, and international cooperation has really led the engagement, um, and the minister there um, has been, you know, the horn as a had been her priority. So, um, you know, this is definitely institutionalized into um, into UAE foreign policy making. That said, the instruments of influence, particularly the financial ones, are often through um, state-backed uh, uh, corporate entities, and uh, and Mubadala did a lot of the uh, targeted investing or was tasked with some of the targeted investing, uh, particularly in Ethiopia early on in 2018. Um, so it's it's not, I wouldn't say it's about, you know, yes, there are important individual figures and, and Sheikh Tanun and, and IHC is an important one to consider now, particularly in the case of Sudan. Um, but this is this was very much part of a larger, you know, institutional priority of the state. I think that is probably lessened now, as I said, because of the um, the kind of changing dynamics in the in the Yemen war. Okay, great. Um, one other question on the GCC influences on internal dynamics. I know there's a chapter in our volume which looks at Kuwait, for example, and how it's had a a significant impact on building capacity through its uh, foreign aid program, but also through an normative influence uh, through engagement of its parliaments on, on these kinds of decisions. Um, can anyone sort of chime in on, um, on aspects of GCC influence and its in, in interactions with, uh, with internal dynamics in, in specific cases? I can add a, a bit of a broad overview, which seems to be my calling for today. Um, leaving the, the more nitty gritty analysis to my, my more qualified colleagues. But I think, I think Gulf internal politics is a, a critical juncture um, in a number of different ways, be they political, economic, social, or geopolitical. Um, and I think to expect any type of coherence or, or any strong coherence amongst the Gulf states 
on on serious political economic issues, I think is perhaps a little misguided. And I'm, I'm thinking in particular of of the the sort of the political transition, new leaders passing the generation, shifting generational leadership, the shift of economic policy, the implementation of, of taxation in certain places, and I don't think there's a, a clear consensus on many of these issues. The most obvious one, of course, is is the question of Islamism, and you have those two very strong camps emerging within this supposedly coherent block of the GCC. Uh, one that is largely pro-Islamist and one that is staunchly anti-Islamist. And whilst there may well be a resolution to the Qatar blockade, and I think we've seen all but that being resolved, the legacy of that and the legacy of distrust at an individual level, I think is is really going to be quite prominent. We see that, of course, with the Saudi-Turkey issue, um, where the personalities involved, uh, the crown prince's um, vivid and quite vitriolic disdain for, for Mr. Erdogan is, is really prominent. An individual agency is having a big impact on, on political relations between two states. And I think we can see that as well within the GCC. And we'll see it more, at least from, from my discussions with, with folks. And that sense of division is only going to increase as as domestic transformations take place within particular Gulf states. For example, I was talking to, to some Bahrainis last week about how they position themselves with regard to developments in Saudi. And there is this sense that Saudi Arabia's ongoing um, opening up under Mohammed bin Salman means that the Bahrainis have to open up even further in order to have any type of competitive advantage with regard to attracting FDI. And that risks then opening up schisms with the Saudis. So there's a lot of different permutations playing out here. And I think given the sensitivities and the the complexities at play, to assume that there'll be this this real coherence amongst the GCC states is, is probably a lot misguided. Okay, moving on to uh, Turkey playing a role in uh, Somali presidential elections. Maybe one for you, Uma, on um, whether it's taking sides and to what it, uh, degree of uh, of impact it's having there. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so basically, it's more that Turkey has remained a consistent uh, in terms of its engagement with the Somali state, or as we know, it as Mogadishu. Uh, and as, as always, always uh, being a staunch uh, proponent of uh, United Somalia and uh, the eventual, you can say, amalgam of uh, the federal uh, member states of Somalia into the broader Somali state. But apparently for some time, this has been seen uh, synonymous with the political support for uh, and uh, the political project of Fermaju. And the greater... Uh, so for last year and so there had the polarization within the Somali political sphere has uh, touched extremely new levels. There have been a, a parallel, you can say, uh, security uh, institutions within the capital, even parallel uh, uh, security forces working under parallel forces under parallel camps, uh, one led by you can say the prime minister and the other by by the president himself. So this greater polarization within Somalia, I think it has to some extent uh, 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 gotten into the massive uh, goodwill for Turkey that existed there. But uh, if you see critical, um, you can say, um, critical issues with regards to Turkey-Somali relationship, the training of Somali recruits in, in within Turkey. So they are living in Turkey, they are being trained there, they learn the language. Also, Somali students have been given a huge number of scholarships. Uh, they are going to Turkey. So if you actually visit Turkey uh, at conferences, at various uh, discussions, you do see uh, a representation or prominence of uh, Somalis there, which is quite interesting that uh, you don't see it uh, for some of the other countries where you can say Turkey has invested within Africa. So this shows that uh, Turkey's uh, uh, presence or a consistence on part of Turkey uh, with regards to its political engagement within Somalia. But uh, 
it's it's more or less like uh, you can say Turkey's uh, engagement right now with Pakistan because uh, the relationship between the Prime Minister and President Erdogan is really close, and they even gave a statement that uh, he should continue. So at some times, uh, the broader strategic uh, you can say uh, pressures or determinants pushing these engagements they are a bit. Uh, uh you can say uh, overwhelmed by personal uh, ambitions or personal you can say uh, wishes of uh, the leaders uh, particularly in case of turkey but i think it's also true in case of saudi arabia as well uae actually seems to be an outlier in this regard where uh, very crude pragmatism uh, often uh, dictates uh, the policies so yeah i guess that uh, turkey's engagement with somalia and with the prime president uh, uh, for Maju will will continue and will be a constant uh, fixture thank you very much and then perhaps one final question as the time is is drawing on there's um one about how qatar may have shown the limits or the qatar crisis has shown the limits of gcc engagement i think my initial response to that question is that actually there's all sorts of other uh, inherent limits to uh, to gulf gcc uh, horn relations um, including what the international, uh, the rest of the international community is doing. We've, we've spoken already about US, Russian, Chinese policy to some extent, expediencies surrounding Yemen, which we touched on, but also the vision strategies and the fact that a lot of the interest now is towards uh, funneling a lot of resources and attention on the domestic level, because, uh, and coupled with perhaps the, the move to carbon neutral um uh, aims and objectives because the time is drawing to a close and how quickly they can transition and um and which places inherent limits on an emphasis on other economic relations internationally uh, which i've looked at particularly in asia uh, and perhaps less so on on the horn uh, as i said particularly in the yemen context um, i don't know if anyone else has any other opinions on that yeah, I would say I, I agree with you, Robert. I think that's um, that's absolutely correct. And I think the question right now and the current windfall that the Gulf oil exporters are receiving is what do you do with that? Do you put it away and understand that this is the, the last oil boom? Um, do you use it to prepare for um, you know a, a different kind of energy and, and electricity production at home? Um, do you invest into hydrogen uh, abilities and to you know be the the kings of of that industry in the years to come? And is there less at the disposal for this kind of uh, foreign economic statecraft? Um, and I was frankly surprised that uh, that the Gulf states came to the table so quickly um, in the aid of Egypt again, um, though to a much lesser degree than what we saw um, years ago. Um, and this kind of interest, though I wouldn't say it's necessarily help, but interest in um, in supporting uh, the economy of Turkey, which I think was is going to be extremely vulnerable um, in the next year or so. Uh, so you know, this is this again will play more importantly to a domestic audience, which is dealing with the implementation of taxes with reduced subsidies of energy and uh, and water. Uh, and fuel. So um, it becomes more complex in, in how you deploy uh, these tools abroad. And that's why the mechanism of using state-linked investment firms and, uh, and, and corporates becomes um, a very useful tool uh, because it's not the same as uh, a blank check from the government or the foreign ministry itself. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, Uma, you wanted to say something? Yeah, just a little comment that uh, the political sphere within the Horn is actually turning a little bit into interstate cooperation and intrastate conflict. So like there is a new trika of Fermaggio, uh, Ferviki, the Eritrean president, and uh, Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed of Ethiopia. They're very close with each other. So, me, so a traditional feature of Horn politics, which has been interstate conflict, uh, is maybe is now being replaced by intrastate conflict. So each, every of them is facing a resistance or a rebellion or sort of insurgency uh, within their own state. So I think that may impact upon the broader horn, uh, broader Gulf or Middle Eastern engagement with the horn. Thank you very much. Well, I'm consciously aware that we've got uh, one minute left. So uh, unless there's any final uh, quick notes, um, I'd just like to thank again uh, AGSIW for, for hosting this event, uh, to my fellow panellists, Karen, Uma, Simon, 
for such great contributions to the book and uh, conceptual and empirical insights. And I look forward to working with you again sometime soon. Um, so thank you very much.